In this presentation, you will examine the major events of the Jackson presidency. There's a lot of information in this presentation. Make sure and take good notes. And as usual, if you have any questions or need clarification, please make sure and see me. Andrew Jackson, 1767 to 1845. I was born for a storm. Calm does not suit me. And this says a lot about Andrew Jackson and what kind of person he was. So here's a snapshot of the major events of Andrew Jackson's presidency. Hopefully by now we know that he was a little bit different than his predecessors. Uh, he was a man of the people. Or was he? That's a question we'll analyze at the end of this presentation. But I'm going to go through each one of these and explain them briefly. And hopefully they will become clear. The election of 1824 was the first time that Andrew Jackson ran for president. And I have this graphic up here and all you really need to know is that this represents something called the Electoral College. And the Electoral College is fairly complicated and you'll learn much more about it when you get to American government in ninth grade. But all you need to know for purposes of this presentation is that each state has a certain amount of electoral votes. And you can see here the more populated states have a larger number of electoral votes. So in the 1824 election there was the electoral vote which if a president won Pennsylvania he got 28 votes, Ohio 16 votes, and the popular vote which is the individual vote. That said there were four men running for president that year. Usually there are two. So when all the votes were totaled up Here's the results of the electoral votes. The Constitution says that someone running for president must get a majority of electoral votes. Now if there's 261 total electoral votes, the candidate must get at least 131, that's a majority, in order to be declared president. Now because there were four candidates, None of them have a majority. When no one has a majority of electoral votes, the House of Representatives gets together and they elect the president. And that's exactly what they did. And that year they elected John Quincy Adams, who didn't have the popular vote and didn't have the electoral vote, but still won because none of these other ones had a majority and it went to the House of Representatives. Now in the next election, 1828, Jackson soundly trounces John Quincy Adams and becomes President of the United States with 178 to 83 electoral votes. When Jackson became President, he initiated something called the spoils system. And that's taken from a famous proverb that says, to the victor go the spoils. Can you guess what victor is the root word of? Well, from this word we get victory, victorious, which means the winner. And frequently they say, in war, to the victor go the spoils. The winner of a conflict wins additional benefits beyond just the subject of the conflict. So if two countries are fighting over a piece of land and one side wins, they get that land, but they also get everything that the losers have. Everything that they get from the losers is called the spoils, the spoils of war. All the stuff you get in addition to what you were fighting about. But you can also be a victor in an election. And this is how Jackson is going to take this proverb and create the spoils system. Not only did he become the president, but he got a bunch of other good stuff too. After taking office, Jackson fires many Federalist officials. So when he took the office of president, there were people that had jobs in the government. He decided he was going to fire a lot of them and give their jobs to his loyal supporters and his friends. The spoil system is giving political jobs to loyal supporters. And that's exactly what Jackson did. 
Now this is a photograph from the late 1800s of the White House. The White House is where the president lives and also where he works. Now frequently back then and today as well, when the president needs to meet with his advisors and his staff, there are meeting rooms just for that. Well, Andrew Jackson was such a unique individual and such a uh, kind of man's man and man of the people that frequently he would hold those meetings in the kitchen of the White House. And there were times when he would call together all his trusted advisors and they would discuss the future of the United States in the kitchen. And that was called the kitchen cabinet, not cabinet like where you keep the dishes. This kind of cabinet is a group of people that help advise the president. And that was their nickname. The Tariff of Abominations. This is pretty tricky and it's very, very important. This is one of the factors that led to the US Civil War. Now again, it's a little bit tricky, but I'm going to do my best to explain it to you. The North and the South had different economies. Hopefully you know this. The South was based on right agriculture and farming. The North was based on good industry and factories where they made products. But Europe also had a fully functioning industrial complex. In other words, there were many factories in Europe that would also make products. And what the Europeans did is they sold their manufactured goods to the South. But the North also sold manufactured goods to the South. However, the Europeans sold their goods to the South for less money than the Northerners did. So the Northerners solved that problem by putting a tax on everything coming from Europe into the South. Now, Obviously the Southerners did not like this because it made all the goods coming from Europe more expensive. And what did they have to do? Can you guess what they did? If the South can't afford to buy from Europe, because of this tax, they have to buy from the North. Exactly. And that was called the Tariff of Abomination, this tax. And the Southerners were very angry about it. They needed manufactured goods. They could get those goods either from the North or from Europe, but they were a lot cheaper from Europe. The Northerners slam a tax, and now it's too expensive for the South to buy from Europe, so they are forced to buy from the North. The Tariff of Abominations. And this led to something called the Nullification Crisis. To nullify something means to basically cancel it out or to ignore it. And South Carolina decided that they were going to take that tariff, take that tax, and nullify it. In other words, ignore it. Now that's a big deal because when the federal government puts a tax on something or when they enact a law, the whole country has to follow it. And South Carolina said, we're just not going to do it. Jackson didn't take too well to that. And the nullification crisis sparked off the second major cause of the Civil War. And that's called states' rights. And we'll get into this much more as the year progressive progresses, but basically states' rights means that the states, people in the states, especially in the South, believed that if a federal law, a law that applies to the whole country, if it hurts them, hurts their economy in some way, that they should have the right to ignore it. It's basically the difference between the federal government making laws or the states having the power to make laws that just apply to them. And that's going to be a serious source of contention between the North and the South, which is going to lead to the Civil War. This is something a Southerner might say. If there be no protective power in the reserved rights of the states, they must be forced to rebel. Basically, a Southerner might say, if we don't have our rights as a state, 
to nullify federal law, to ignore federal law, if that right is taken away, then we must rebel. And that's exactly what happens, and it leads to the Civil War. States' rights, the nullification crisis. Another major event during Jackson's presidency was his having to deal with the National Bank. Okay, we all know what a bank is, and during this time period there was a national bank that handled the country's money. And many people, including Jackson, believed that the bank was corrupt. However, in a court case, Supreme Court case, McCullough versus Maryland, the Supreme Court said the National Bank is constitutional. Jackson came along and said, wait a minute, I think this violates the Constitution. You can't have a national bank. It doesn't say in the Constitution anywhere you can have one. So I think we should get rid of it. And it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, oh, it's constitutional. You can have it. So Andrew Jackson decided he was going to veto the charter of the Second National Bank because he believed that the National Bank benefited the rich and ignored the common man. Once again, there is Jackson, man of the people, and he vetoed it, thereby removing the Second National Bank. This is the Hydra. Jackson slaying the many-headed monster. It's called a Hydra. When one head is destroyed, two grow in its place. And this is a really excellent political cartoon showing Jackson taking on these powerful men representing the Second National Bank. And Jackson tries to take it down and does. Okay, The Panic of 1837. You can read the causes here on your own. Hit pause if you need to. But what you need to know mainly about this is that in 1837 an economic downturn struck called the Panic of 1837 which led to an economic depression. Basically, a depression is when money loses its value. People don't have any money to spend, and they're not earning money because they can't get jobs, and that can certainly lead to a panic. So you're going to want to make sure you understand these causes and understand that this economic downturn led to a depression. Okay, This is a nice graphic organizer. I've gone over these along the side, the tariff of abominations, states' rights, and the nullification crisis. But what this shows is how each one threatens the Union. The Union, at this point, is another word for the United States, the country. And what this shows is how the North has a position on the tariff, the South has a position. The North and the South have their views on each of these, the tariff, states' rights, and nullification. And they are at odds. The North and the South can't agree on these. And this is going to start to heat up and eventually it's going to boil over. Okay, just taking a look at how some things changed after the age of Jackson when he was president. Campaigning, when people ran for office, now, after Jackson, people are appealing to the common man. Someone running for office knows they need to appeal to the every person in order to win. Winning the presidency. After Jackson, it was the popular vote and the electoral college, the electoral votes. Before this, it used to be what was called a caucus, which is just a, a meeting, a group, a poll of powerful elites. So the very wealthy basically got together and pick the president themselves. And that is no longer going to happen after Jackson's presidency. The government, the spoil system, giving jobs to friends and supporters. Who can vote? After Jackson, the requirements to vote are going to be lowered or eliminated. And we'll get into his role in the Indians and the Bureau of Indian Affairs next. So you'll have to decide, was Jackson more a man of the people or a king? Think about this, discuss it with your friends, and any questions you may have, please seek clarification.